and they will get a Bible into your hands. And let's open up to Titus chapter 3. I need to make a correction to Tom's announcement. Um, I'm going to finish Titus next week, not the 15th. So um, we'll actually finish all the way through verse 15 today of chapter 3, and that will finish the exposition of the book, but we're going to do some kind of summary of some sort next week, I think. So that's the plan. So Titus chapter 3, we, we get a look at the, the kinds of verses that oftentimes as you read your Bible, you just kind of go, oh yeah, I'll just turn the page. Because that's just the closing greetings or the opening greetings, you know, those first part verses that you skip past at the beginning of a letter and those few verses at the end of a letter that you skip past, you know those? Uh, we get a look at those. And every time we do, every time I do, I study those, I'm I'm, I'm shocked and surprised how much is there, um, and we impoverish ourselves if we do that, if we skip over them. So we're going to look at those last four verses of Titus, and from the very opening verses of this letter that Paul wrote to Titus, um, Paul has appeared to have one focus on his mind for the church that is on the island uh, in, uh, the church is on the island of Crete throughout the cities. Uh, his focus has been in this letter to set the church in order. Do you remember that? In chapter 1, verse 5, for this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains, appointing elders. That was all that Titus was supposed to do. The gospel had already come across the island of Crete, it had come through the island, but the church was not very well established yet in that gospel, nor in the sound teaching that spells out how believers are supposed to live in light of the gospel's transforming influence on their lives. And so for three chapters, we have not been able to look away from this idea of setting the church in order. In the first chapter, Paul talked about how important scrutinized leaders are, qualified elders. They must labor with the word of God in the church in such a way so that two things can happen, a negative thing and a positive thing. The negative thing that must happen is that lies must be silenced. False teaching must be stopped. Um, divisive messages and words and teaching must have no opportunity anywhere in the church at all to advance. So scrutinized leaders take care of silenced lies. And then positively, the elders are supposed to use the word of God in a way where lives become increasingly sanctified or more holy, more godly. And so we've seen that over and over through every paragraph, every word, every chapter in this letter. And so now... When Paul comes to his closing remarks and his closing greetings, we're quickly reminded that there is something much, much bigger going on than just the churches on the island of Crete. The instruction in Titus focuses us in where the gospel had already come and the church that must be established and strengthened and put in order where the gospel had already come. And now the closing remarks of Titus lift up our heads and our eyes to see that the gospel is going far beyond the island of Crete in the Mediterranean. And it's really, these verses are a helpful blend from the Apostle Paul for us. Should the church give itself to being established in the gospel? Or should, should the church give itself to extending the gospel? Both of those ideas were at peace within Paul with one another. He gave himself to both of them tirelessly, zealously, and sacrificially. And, and we must labor for the same in our own hearts and minds and in our own church family. We need to be established in the gospel. And the gospel must be extended to the ends of the earth. And this passage can help us to hold both of those things in place. Let's look at verses 12 to 15. 
Paul says in his closing words to Titus, when I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis, for I've decided to spend the winter there. Diligently help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way so that nothing is lacking for them. Our people must also learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Let's pray. Lord, we give thanks to you um, for those who perhaps left their comfort zones to um, come and share with us the truth of the gospel, of how we as sinners um, were separated from you, that we had a penalty that had to be paid, but that we could not pay on our own. And that there was a substitute willing to step into our place of punishment and bear that penalty and bear your wrath. And that if we would only look away from ourselves and trust in him and and not try to do good deeds to earn righteousness or favor or status with you, but if we would only turn away from ourselves and trust in your son, we, we could be saved. Lord, somebody perhaps did what was challenging for them, was uncomfortable for them to talk to us, or maybe it was very natural, but Lord, what we are thankful for is that they did. Whether it was a mom or a dad or a a son or a daughter, a friend at school, a, a stranger, a teacher, a student. We are thankful that there were people who were willing to carry the gospel beyond themselves to us, that we might hear the gospel, repent and believe, and be saved by you. Father, we pray that you would um, use us in the lives of others to bring the gospel far beyond us, Open our eyes now as we watch a man given over to the mission of the gospel, Paul and several other men, names, co-laborers in the gospel mission with him and reignite our passion again for the gospel to be extended and we ask it in Christ's name, amen. What is this passage Offering us today, it's this, you see it up on the screen there, Paul's closing words can provide for us three vantage points that allow us to see our church's broader involvement in the gospel mission. I think that was the effect that his final words would have had on the church in Crete. He wanted them to look up from what they were dealing with on a daily, weekly basis, and he wanted them to see that there was a whole lot more going on for the gospel in the Mediterranean. And so here's the first vantage point. Number one, Paul's urgent fellowship for the mission. Verse 12. The main idea of verse 12 is found in the main clause, which is, make every effort to come to me, Titus, at Nicopolis. That's the main idea. Paul reveals at the end of the letter here what he's planning, what he's been thinking regarding Titus. Remember, in chapter 1, verse 5, he left him there on the island to set in order the things that were not in order. And Paul's desire is, even in sending him to do that, leaving him there to do that, is that Titus would then hurry, make haste, and come to Paul at Nicopolis. It's an imperative. It's a command. There's an urgency in Paul's words regarding this. Titus must stay on the island for now, but the time will come for him to leave, and then he must not waste any time in getting to Nicopolis. Well, when will that time come? Verse 12, when I send Artemis or Tychicus to you. One of those two co-laborers are with Paul as he's writing the letter and will be sent by Paul at some point to Crete. And upon 
being relieved by one of those two men, Titus will then make haste to come to Nicopolis. We're not sure what the urgency is that's in Paul's mind. Some think that Paul feels the pressure coming on him again, that persecution is coming upon him and that he is upsetting Rome and its comfortable way of life without the gospel and that he knows his time of freedom is running out. Some suggest even that Paul knows that if he is imprisoned the next time he won't be let go but that it will be the end of his life. And so perhaps what is happening at this point in his life in A.D. 65 is that he is sending out left and right and he is mobilizing his co-laborers in a a broad, extensive plan to get them to the places that they must go so that even if he dies for Christ, the gospel will still be extended. We don't know. It's difficult to know what the urgency is. Something is compelling him to make Titus hurry. Who is Artemis in verse 12? We have no idea. This is the only place where he is mentioned in the New Testament. But if he is with Paul and if he is to potentially replace Titus on the island, he must be yet another trustworthy co-laborer in the gospel mission. Who is this man, Tychicus? There are five mentions of him in the New Testament. He first shows up back in Acts chapter 20, verse 4. You can turn there with me. I want you to see this. Acts 20, verse 4. He was among the party of men that Paul put together who had gone through the Gentile churches that Paul had been to and planted. And he took that group of men, they, they took offerings from those Gentile churches and were to deliver that offering to the church in Jerusalem. This is about A.D. 56. They're mentioned in verse 4 of Acts chapter 20. And Paul was accompanied by all of these men, and you can see that Tychicus' name is there as one who was from Asia, Asia Minor. And when Paul was in his first imprisonment at the end of the book of Acts, Paul wrote two important letters, a letter to the Colossians and his letter to the Ephesians. And it looks like Tychicus was the one who delivered both of those letters. Let me show you. Take a look at Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. Paul says there, As to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant in the Lord, will bring you information. That's because he's delivering the letter. And Paul doesn't have to write about all of his affairs and what are happening, what's happening to him because this faithful servant and brother will tell them. In chapter 6 of Ephesians, verse 21, the same type of thing is said, but that you also may know about my circumstances, how I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make everything known to you. And if you could turn back to Titus now and think about where we're at at this point in AD 65, about a year from our current context with Titus on the island of Crete, at some point Paul is going to get arrested again and he's going to be taken and imprisoned in Rome. And Tychicus at that point will be sent then by Paul to Ephesus to relieve Timothy there. You can maybe turn back a page from Titus to 2 Timothy 4 verse 12. Look at this. But Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus, which is where Timothy is, which is to whom Paul is writing. And when you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus and the books, especially the parchments. Which makes me wonder if Tychicus is the one that was sent at that point. Perhaps the one who was sent to relieve Titus might have been Artemis. Not really sure, but back to Titus chapter 3, verse 12. Paul, at this point, doesn't know which one he will send. But what he does know and what he has decided is that he is going to spend the winter at Nicopolis. Uh, The tense for the verb is in the perfect tense, which means that he has has a settled resolve or a decision to stay in Nicopolis. He's going to go there. He's going to spend the winter there. He's settled about that. Now, notice that Paul is not yet in Nicopolis. Because if he was, what would he say? 
for I have decided to spend the winter, what? Here. But he's not there yet, so he has not made his way. He's somewhere. So the question is, where, where is Paul then as he writes this letter? And the, most believe that he is in, um, on his way to Macedonia or is in Macedonia, and we can put up our beloved map, and I get to use my laser pen yet one more time. Here's the island of Crete, and Ephesus, if I can see, is right there. In Asia Minor, this is modern-day Turkey, and Macedonia is this region up here. And we believe that Paul, as he is writing, is writing either en route to Macedonia or he is in Macedonia, perhaps at Philippi. And Nicopolis is right here on the other side of the province of Achaia. Okay? So we'll leave that map up for a minute because we're going to spend some time looking at that. If Paul is in Macedonia, perhaps he's in Philippi, as I said. And upon leaving Titus on the island of Crete, remember what we said he did, he went to Ephesus where he was with Timothy at the church in Ephesus. And the church in Ephesus was in a bad shape um, at the elder and teacher level. And Paul had to put some men out of the church in Ephesus. And most likely, these men are elders. Turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. I want you to see what Paul faced after he left the island of Crete and left Titus there. 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says to Timothy, you need to fight the good fight of faith in verse 18 of chapter 1. Keeping faith and a good conscience, with conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. And among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. We don't believe that these are just regular men in the church, but these were actually elders. That what Paul said to them in Acts chapter 20, that um, even from among your own selves, wolves will arise. It's very probable that these two men are some of those kinds of men. It's heartbreaking. And Paul had to put them out of the church. He then left Timothy to finish the work in Ephesus while Paul says that he went on to Macedonia. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. As I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. So Paul left Ephesus and he started to make his way northward from Ephesus this way up to Macedonia. That's where he's headed. Where is Nicopolis? You can see that there. It is on the uh, west side of this peninsula in the Adriatic Sea. On the, it's about 200 miles east of Italy. This is Italy over here. You can see the boot, right? And from Athens, it's about 200 miles northwest to the coast. And it is possible that perhaps... Paul has in mind that Nicopolis will be the next mission base for the gospel to go forward. Um, Paul was eager to extend the gospel, we believe, to the region called Dalmatia, which um, was another province. Can't really see it as much on this map, but Dalmatia is this area up here. It's where modern-day um, Croatia is and Bosnia and Herzeg. Um, and we base that on 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Take a look at that. I know we're turning a lot. I know this is map-oriented. It is historical, but it helps put some things together for you. It can anyway. Paul says some heartbreaking words regarding several men. Make every effort to come to me soon. Verse 9, for Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me, and he's gone to Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, and Titus has gone to Dalmatia. We don't believe that that is a bad thing he's saying about Titus, um, but just simply that he is alone. Some left him for terrible reasons, and some went on because they had missions to carry out. Most likely, then, I think this means that Titus was relieved on the island of Crete, I'm guessing by Artemis, and that Titus then did actually meet up with Paul at Nicopolis, and at some point, Paul sent Titus onto Dalmatia, and Paul was soon arrested afterwards. So if Nicopolis um, became a sending base, all um, Titus had to do is just travel straight north to that region 
of Dalmatia and carry out the gospel mission there. And so that's the historical context of Titus chapter 3, verse 12, if you'll turn back there with me. Paul has a partnership with Titus in the gospel that will be implemented from Nicopolis when winter comes. And that partnership is urgent. Paul is urgent for Titus to get there. As soon as his replacement arrives, he is to make every effort to come to Paul there. Let's go back to our outline and away from the map. What effect would that have on the church on the island of Crete as they read that? The letter and its contents focuses our attention directly in on the church's need to be set in order so everybody's eyes would be turned looking in and looking down in on the church to zero in on scrutinized leaders, qualified elders, right, who need to shepherd the flock. And Paul trained our eyes in this letter to look at how lies must be silenced in the church. And so all of our attention is looking within at where truth and where sound teaching is taking place and where lies are and that must be stopped. And, and Paul focuses us in on how sound teaching nourishes us to be able to live a godly life. And so as we read the contents of this letter, we're overwhelmed by how we must be established in the gospel. Everything must be in order. So what effect then does verse 12 have on the church? The effect it's had on me in reading it and studying it is it's, vantage, it's a vantage point to lift our heads up and to look and to see from uh, beyond our own four walls, so to speak. To, they would have looked across the Mediterranean in their minds to Nicopolis. We, we can look across our world to where other servants in the gospel are plotting and planning the gospel to go forward even further. Paul's urgent partnership for the gospel mission allows the church to look up and to see a broader and deeper and longer gospel mission going on in the world through other co-laborers. And I think it reveals something very important in Paul's mind and in his plan. Paul was a man who believed the gospel had to run as far and wide across the globe as it could. He, he set his eyes on Spain. We believe he went there before he went to the island of Crete. And when you look at that map of the Mediterranean world in the first century, Paul single-handedly spread the gospel further than any other man, maybe even since then. And as Paul's eye was on the horizon for the extension of the gospel, at the same time, his heart was burdened for the establishment of the church where the gospel had already come. Scrutinized leaders, silenced lies, sanctified lives. So both the extension of the gospel and the establishment of the church, both of those ideas lived at peace within Paul. And it's a vantage point for us as we've been looking at the establishment of a church, what it means to be set in order, it gives us the opportunity to look up beyond ourselves. What a vantage point. The second vantage point is in verses 13 and 14. Number two, it's the church's benevolent discipleship for the mission. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. This is a discipleship opportunity for Titus with the church. And it's a discipleship of the church that's characterized by a benevolent heart to take care of needs that must be met. In verse 13, look at it here. Diligently help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way so that nothing is lacking for them. In that verse, Paul has something very important for Titus to take charge of himself, not necessarily provide from his own resources from, but it's Titus' job to implement this and make sure that it happens. To make sure that two other co-laborers in the gospel mission are well supplied as they come to Crete and then they continue on wherever Paul has them going. We're not told where. And that supplying of need for those two co-laborers becomes an opportunity for Titus then to dis disciple the church. Verse 14, our people must also learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs. Contextually, what are those pressing needs? It's the ones he just mentioned. There are some men coming through, co-laborers in the gospel. They cannot leave lacking anything. We must meet their needs. They're urgent. They're important. And so Titus 
will do that with Zenos and Apollos in verse 13. And then he must help the church to learn how to do that well, to be discipled in that, to disciple the church from and in that benevolent heart. So that's a discipleship characterized by a willingness to be benevolent toward the gospel mission, the gospel servants on the gospel mission. In verse 13, this is another imperative, diligently help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. That idea of helping them on their way means to supply them with material needs, whatever they had need for. It most likely even included traveling with them for a certain portion of their journey. And Titus was supposed to do this supplying of their needs earnestly. This is, a, this is an earnestness that's not there because there's a time pressure, but it's an earnestness because it's just important. This is the most important thing. So be earnest in it. And this means that whatever clothing they needed, whatever food, whatever supplies, whatever money they needed, waste no time in supplying it to them for this purpose, verse 13, so that nothing is lacking for them. Nothing. These two men, upon leaving the churches of Crete on the way to wherever it is that they are going, they were not to leave with unmet needs. Paul mentions Zenos the lawyer. We, we don't know who he is except that it was helpful to refer to him as a lawyer to distinguish him probably from some other Zenos. He was either skilled in Mosaic law and Paul perhaps used him among Jewish converts or he was skilled in Roman law. We don't know which. He has a Greek name, but that doesn't tip us off one way or the other as to whether he was Jewish or Gentile necessarily. But we do know who Apollos is. He first appeared in um, Acts chapter 18, verse 24. Remember, this is just prior to Paul's third missionary journey when he is going to Ephesus. And Apollos shows up in Ephesus, and he starts talking about Jesus. And Priscilla and Aquila are there, if you remember. And he does not have complete knowledge regarding Jesus. And so Priscilla and Aquila have to come alongside him, this man who was called mighty in the scriptures. And eventually, in verse 27 of Acts chapter 18, he wanted to go on to Achaia, which is where Corinth was. And so he was a, a trusted co-laborer in the gospel as his knowledge of Jesus Christ grew. And these two men, Zenos and Apollos, are the ones who are delivering the letter of Titus from Paul to Titus. These are the guys carrying the letter. But they are on some other mission for the gospel that will take them beyond Crete. I mean, so do you see Paul's mind? I mean, he, it's just this web. Paul's thinking, I left you, Titus, there, but that's not all I'm thinking of. I'm headed over to Nicopolis. We're going to have a base. I need you to get to me because of what we're going to do. And to, so that you know that, I'm going to send some other guys who are going to bring the letter. But they're not just coming to deliver the letter to you. They're going someplace else. And Paul was just pushing co-laborers and shoving them out in all different directions across the Mediterranean world. And Titus is to make sure that these gospel mission servants are not lacking in anything for their journey. And Paul can't think, help but think of how that will be an opportunity for the church to learn how to do the same thing. And so, verse 14, our people must also learn. They must learn this. What? To engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs. This tells you something of what Paul thinks a pressing or a good deed is. At least in this context, it's the he includes the helping of other Christians on their way in the gospel mission. Certainly, there are many other kinds of good deeds that they must learn to do as well. But what does Paul mean here by pressing needs? He means the kind of urgent needs that ones like Zenos and Apollos had as they were traveling. Needs that were absolutely necessary for the advancement of the gospel. And the church is to engage in good deeds to meet those. And that is the exact same phrasing found in verse 8. Look up at verse 8. This is a trustworthy statement. This gospel that I just shared before that, Paul says, was referring to. 
And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God, watch this, will be careful to engage in good deeds. The idea in that is that the church is to take leadership over the doing of good deeds. You remember we talked about that? And those good deeds will meet the pressing needs. So the church is not to wait around and say, oh, those guys have a need. Well, we'll let's just wait and see who meets those needs. Maybe they'll get a job on their own and they'll supply it themselves. The church was not to wait around for that. They were to step up and take leadership over even their own good deeds in order to meet those pressing needs. They must learn, verse 14, not just that they should do that, but they are to learn how to do that. And they are going to watch Titus, in verse 13, do that with Zenos the lawyer and Apollos. It's an opportunity for discipleship so that they know how to supply and how to satisfy pressing needs of others, and in this context, particularly the needs of missionaries making their way from one place to the next. Why? Verse 14, at the end there, so that they will not be unfruitful. So that they, our people, the church, will not be unfruitful. They, they can't be fruitless people. They can't be unproductive people. Paul's thought is this. If the church does not learn how to do this, if the church is not trained how to take care of gospel mission servants who are on their way, they then will be unfruitful in God's eyes. And if the church is going to be fruitful for God in anything, it better be in the advancement of the gospel, right? So what effect should this have? Would this have had on their church, even on ours? These churches were not in a good condition, remember? They were in desperate need of being set in order. They needed scrutinized leaders who could silence lies and help Believers have sanctified lives through sound teaching. Those things, when they are all present, scrutinized leaders, silenced lies, and sanctified lives, when those are together, the church is capable of learning how to meet those needs. But when lies are not silenced like they have been in prior to the writing of Titus, when, when false teachers and divisive men are able to just wander through the church and get into households and turn households upside down. You remember that? Chapter 1, verse 10, there are many rebellious men who must be silenced. Verse 11, they're upsetting whole families. When that happens, and at that time when a pressing need of missionaries comes through, is that church ready? Does that church know how to meet a pressing need by doing good deeds for it? No, the church misses the opportunity that God has before it, and that church is fruitless. They won't have their resources ready to go for others. They won't even have a heart that's thinking in that direction. All of the resources will instead go towards the ones who are upsetting whole families, teaching things that they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. Where's all the money going in the church when a church is not established? It's going towards those who are dividing the church. But the resources need to be ready to help others, even outside the church. And again, in Paul's mind, these two things enjoyed a peaceful coexistence with one another, extending the gospel where there is no church and establishing the church where the gospel already is. Those two things were not at war within Paul. They were not pitted against one another in his mind ever. It was never for him an either or, but it was always a both and. These two are not rivals. They're not opponents. They're partners. And the churches on the island of Crete, they had the gospel, but they did not yet understand the implications of the gospel and sound teaching on them about how they should live their lives. They needed to be established in the gospel and sound teaching that produces godly living. And that's what the letter, the contents of the letter focus in on. And the gospel at the same time is going far beyond them through Zenos and Apollos. And the church had to learn to be ready to do good deeds for that so that they could be a fruitful church for God as the gospel expands across this world. It's not one or the other ever. It's both and. 
And I can just tell you as an elder, I am so encouraged. Your elders are so encouraged by this church family's generous, benevolent heart and attitude and willingness um, to do good deeds that meet the pressing needs of missionaries that we support and have sent to the other side of the world. You have learned how to do that well. You're not unfruitful. There's an illustration maybe that's helpful in this. A a tree doesn't produce fruit so much for itself as for others. And others on the gospel mission to Italy for us as our church, to um, Africa and Philippines when um, Wayman goes and helps strengthen pastoral leaders, indigenous leaders of those churches and other gospel servants in Papua New Guinea that Scott prayed for, they are enjoying your fruitfulness as a church family. It is so encouraging. God's grace is evident within you. There's a last vantage point that helps the church see its broader involvement in the gospel mission. Number three, the church's distant fellowship in the mission. You might never have thought to put the word distant and fellowship together, but I think we can make a case for that here. Perhaps we can see that there are two kinds of fellowship. There's the one that you can only have when you are physically with each other. But Paul, who is writing from someplace far away, maybe from Philippi or Macedonia, he reveals that there is even a distant fellowship that believers automatically have with one another in the mission of the gospel, even though they may never have met or seen each other for a long time. And his greetings at the end of the letter reveal this. He says in verse 15, all who are with me greet you, Titus. Paul is not alone from wherever he is writing, and all who are with him know about Titus at a minimum. Some may know him even. And all of them are interested in what is going on in Crete, even though they may not have ever been there, seen any of the churches. They don't have to meet each other. They don't have to be there to see with their own eyes to recognize that they have fellowship in the gospel mission. There's a gospel family that's formed that you automatically have with other believers when you meet or when you hear of one another. Why are you compelled to pray for people you've never met but that you know are in need of help and prayer for the gospel mission someplace else. It's because you're family with them. And you don't have to be with them physically to have fellowship with them, to have partnership with them. And Paul says, greet those who love us in the faith. Paul knows from his time on the island that there were those who had loving affection for him and he wants them greeted We know that there were also opponents on the island. Chapter 2, verse 8, he tells Titus, you need to be sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. And at a minimum, that is Titus and Paul. The opponents need to be put to shame so that they have nothing bad to say about us. Me, the apostle, you, the delegate of the apostle, Titus. Those would be Rebellious men in verse 10 of chapter 1, those would be the kinds of men who were factious men in chapter 3, verse 10. And Paul might be indicating here in this statement that there are some who are not going to get his greeting. But the ones, he states it positively, the ones who are, are the ones who love him, have affectionate care for him and concern. He states it positively. Finally, he says, grace be with you all. He wants God's undeserved favor and kindness upon all of them. And in this, Paul greets the whole church in the letter that he wrote to one man, except he didn't write it just to one man, we find out. He wrote it to the church. His intent was that at some point eventually, if not sooner, certainly at some point, the whole church would know this letter because he wrote to them. And the simple effect this would have on Christians far away from one another who are greeting one another, even though they've never met, would be something like, we're not the only ones. We're not the only ones in this world. Trying to live out the gospel and trying to extend the gospel 
There are other believers. There are other churches. And we have distant fellowship with one another on the gospel mission. We're a part of something much bigger than ourselves. And that is a perfect place to leave us at the end of this letter. And these are two concerns, gospel concerns, that need to be guarded by us in our hearts and in our minds. The extension of the gospel where there is no church and the establishment of the church where the gospel has already come. Those two gospel concerns must never be pitted against each other in our own minds as if one is more valuable than the other. Paul loved both of those things. He poured himself out for both of these. He spent all of his life in Christ for both of these. They were never pitted against each other in his mind. Now, sometimes churches do that, though. They, they want to focus only on one and not the other. Sometimes we might do that. And there may be seasons within a church's life where one gets more attention than the other. I think we had a season like that where it was crucial for us to spend most of our time, if not all of our time, just trying to strengthen ourselves for the next week. But we must never let these two gospel concerns become separated from one another, pitted against one another, as if we have to choose one or the other. We choose both because that is God's heart in this world through the church. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this letter, and we thank you for, again, the mission of the gospel that came to us through those who were bold and compassionate towards us. They looked upon us in all of our rebelliousness, how we were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. They could see that we were spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another, and they weren't disgusted by us, although I'm sure our sin was an aversion to them, but they had compassion, and they stepped towards us, whether we were young and in our homes as children or whether we were out making a mess of our lives as adults. And they shared the gospel with us. And for some of us, it took over and over and over. It took perseverance in them waiting for you, Father, to open our eyes. And so, God, we are thankful for how the gospel mission even came to us personally. We're thankful for how the gospel mission through one local church in this valley, hoped to plant a church in Tempe. And many were saved. We're thankful for that. And Father, we want to hold on to these two concerns that are Paul's concerns. They are the gospel's concern. The church, where the gospel already is, must be strong. And the gospel, where the church is not, must be preached. God, I pray that you would raise up within this church family here the perfect blend of family members who, some who are more gifted at one than the other. And I pray, Lord, that there would just be this harmony between us for what our passions are that we would not set if we feel we are more evangelistically inclined that our passions are better than the passions of those who are able to strengthen and edify believers, nor vice versa. But that, Lord, we would love how you wire each one of us and gift each one of us so that we might be able to carry out this very big and important gospel concern. So, Lord, we pray for your help. We pray for your guidance. We pray for success in your eyes in this, Father. We want to be fruitful, not unfruitful. So we depend upon you. We even again humble ourselves and cast ourselves upon you and ask for your blessing. Strengthen us as a church and help us to send the gospel even further. 
And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.